Unitarians and Universalists have a long and illustrious history of leadership in the social justice movements in our country. Unitarians and Universalists like Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and Olympia Brown were among the most prominent leaders in the struggle for women's suffrage. Unitarians were featured prominently in the abolitionist movement of the 1800s, contributing moral, intellectual, and financial leadership to the abolitionist cause. In fact, you can hardly name a social reform movement in the 19th century in which Unitarians and Universalists did not play a major role. Our religious forebears were instrumental in education reform, prison reform, and services for people with disabilities. We may be a religion small in number, but when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. issued his call asking white clergy who supported civil rights to join him in Selma in 1965, more Unitarian Universalist ministers went than any other faith. In recent years, Unitarian Universalists have been deeply involved in the sanctuary movement and the nuclear freeze movement, in work for immigrant rights and in environmental advocacy, just to name a few. But perhaps nowhere else have we been as committed and as successful than in the struggle for equal rights and protections for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and couples. From Massachusetts to Iowa, from Minnesota to North Carolina, all across our nation and beyond our country's borders, we've been instrumental in the struggle to win acceptance, welcome, and equal rights for LGBTQ people. And as of a Friday morning in late June of this year, we celebrate the latest major victory in this movement for freedom, acceptance, and love. The decision of the Supreme Court of the United States of America to make marriage equality the law of the land in all 50 states. So I was putting together this worship service um, when I had to, to check myself. I was like, all right, we're going to celebrate. We are going to celebrate marriage equality. And then I realized that I'd put together a service where kind of all the speakers were straight people. And I was like, that is not right. So I had to kind of eat a little crow and reach out uh, to some members of the church and sort of invite, would you, like, would you like to speak? Would you like to share a reflection? And um, I am so profoundly grateful that... Uh, Susan and Pat and Shannon and Maureen and Allison all all said yes, um, and so I'm going to call them call them up. Um, thank you for uh, blessing me. I know I uh, officiated at uh, you know, Allison and Karen's wedding last September, and and Maureen and Shannon's wedding last March. Um, thank you for blessing us with your story and your presence and your love. And the microphone is yours. Come and give us some wisdom. Good morning. Good morning. I almost feel like we should take a moment before we go on. That was the testimony in one's life and of one's family and how they've been affected by living in this country. It's very powerful. My name is Maureen O'Rourke. I'm Shannon Richards. And we heard there was cake. <laughs> <laughs> and we wondered if that's going to be a lesbian thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to take you back a couple of decades. I'm going to take you back to a sad time. But I'm going to bring it back to the joyful time again. <clears throat> the sad time is that I believe the words gay community came out of the epidemic of AIDS that swept through the communities of San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Boston, Chicago. And that as horrific as that disease was, and of all the sad stories and horrible stories that can come out of that time, 
there was something that came of gay men and lesbians and UUs and so many people who wanted to be there to acknowledge that these lives mattered, that these men did not die in vain. There were vigils. There was ways of, of helping nurses and doctors not feel so scared because of the fear of contagion. And then we went to the march in Washington, the gay march. And we went to the mall. And there was this wonderful, wonderful quilt. And so many wonderful stories. And I, I was there, and we were there, and, and that felt to me like community. That felt to me like we weren't alone, and that these gay men were not alone, and that these others that died of this horrible disease were not alone, that this quilt represented their lives, and that we bared witness to their lives. And we said, thank you. Thank you to them, and thank you to those families who stood with them, and to those in the communities that stood with them. We were coming back from Canada. Talk about the pendulum swing. I'm going to. Oh, like, sorry. She's trying to guide me already. Um, <laughs> that's not unusual. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we were coming back. We were uh, visiting some friends in Toronto, and we were coming back over the bridge. And one of the things that happened, and this is just a small piece of what it means to be married. Um, the, the, gar the, the guard on the U.S. side said, okay, um, after he asked a bunch of questions, how do the two of you, how are you related to each other? How are you, uh, you know, how long have you known each other? And, like, I picked her up on the way or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, we're married. And he looked at us and said, oh, okay. And we went through. So... So that was, that was just really neat. And um, I was thinking of Martin Luther King when he talked about the pendulum swaying towards justice. And this is definitely one of those times when the pendulum actually has swayed towards justice. And I think both Maureen and I want to thank you so much mm -hmm. for being a part of our lives and allowing us to be married and for the turnout that we had. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. you. I just wrote this this morning, so it's on my iPad because I didn't have time to print it out. <laughs> In February of 2010, Pat and I spoke here about being married. The title of our talk was, Now That We Are Married. We got married on July 5th, 2008, here in this sanctuary. It's not, of course, a legal marriage endorsed or recognized by any city, state, or federal entity in this world. However, in our hearts and in the eyes and hearts of our friends, families, and church, we were indeed married. And in many ways, that was all that we needed. But we still needed to have many legal documents. If Pat or I was in the hospital, we had to have the uh, document saying that we could visit each other Anyone, doctor, nurse, family, could bar us from the hospital room, from the bedside of the woman we loved above all others. So we had medical, financial, and general powers of attorney. <laughs> so we could manage one another's finances, which were our finances, real property, and make medical decisions in the case of incapacity. We had to carry these documents when we traveled, give copies to hospitals and doctors, and had to have them at hand in case of emergency. 
There are copies of these on file. I have another one here, too. <laughs> At many of the hospitals in this area. <laughs> And while we have never needed to invoke these, we had to have them. We don't need them now. There have also been changes in our everyday lives, but very few. We are more comfortable saying the other is my wife. Sometimes when people realize we are a couple, they will ask if we are married, and we can say yes. When I'm in a customer's home and Pat comes up in conversation, I am much more likely to say that she is my wife than before marriage was legal in North Carolina. I am still wary and still sometimes don't say that she's my wife or I don't bring her up at all. But mostly there haven't been any changes. We have been in a committed relationship for 22 years, supported by our friends, families, and church. But there's this little thing in my middle, this tiny spot, that cries out with silent joy, wonder, and exultation every time I call Pat my wife. We never thought getting married would be an option for us, and now we are. And the words on our t-shirts from 2008 still ring true, never boring, never <laughs> So I've got a long sermon for you this morning. <laughs> I, did, I did write one, actually. Um, but, but I actually kind of, in the, in the moment of this morning, it was way, way, way more important for you to hear from Allison, and from Shannon and Maureen, and from Susan and Pat than it is to hear my reflections. I want to say just a couple of things um, briefly, though, kind of homily light. And I'll, post, I'll post all my extensive, brilliant reflections online <laughs> for you all to read. But it's tempting. I was tempted when I thought about preaching this morning to, to tell the story of, of all the times for the last 45 years since the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universal Association voted in 1970, 45 years ago, calling on Unitarian Universalists to do all within their power to end discrimination against gay and lesbian people. 1970, the first. I could list all of the things in that history where we could say that Unitarian Universalism has been the great gift to gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender people. But there's something that you ought to know, though. As great as Unitarian Universalists have been, and make no mistake, we've been great. <laughs> the LGBTQ community has actually been even better for Unitarian Universalism. My colleague Tom Shade writes, during the 1980s, a wave of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons came out in our churches or joined our rather staid religious movement. They had long been excluded from organized religious life, and Unitarian Universalists had set about making them welcome. As a consequence of this welcome, Unitarian Universalism was transformed by the presence, energy, gifts, and concerns of our LGBTQ members. Tom Shade writes, I believe they saved us from the decline and decay that affected the rest of the mainline churches. He writes, I doubt any religious denomination, especially one like ours, has ever had such an ambitious goal, from snobbery to radical hospitality in a generation. I think he's absolutely correct. 
when he says that our welcoming embrace of LGBTQ folks saved us from decline and decay, he's making a point about soul. For decades, our churches have simply been places where people could be truly open about who they are, could love who they love, could be fully themselves without having to hide away in a closet or introduce their beloved as their roommate, or be told that their place is in the back pew. This has been true of Unitarian Universalists, not only in San Francisco and Seattle and New York, but it's been equally true at UU churches in Salt Lake City, Utah, and Waco, Texas, and Lynchburg, Virginia, in places where being out might cost you your job or, or your safety or your life. This welcome made our churches places of liberation. Nobody had to keep it a secret from the minister or from the other members of the women's circle that their son was gay. Nobody had to pretend that a music director or a singer in the choir or the beloved high school youth advisor wasn't who they really were. We worried a lot less. We celebrated a lot more. Creativity was celebrated, not feared. Love was celebrated, not feared. The soul was liberated to laugh and love and dance and cry. Our churches became queer, made up of lesbian and gay and straight and bi people, but universally queer. The queer theologies of our coming-of-age youth weren't silenced or challenged, embraced. The grandmothers getting arrested at Moral Mondays, wearing their hats and pins. I weren't told grandmother's not supposed to be like this. Our choir singing a piece from Kinky Boots and everybody clapping along and smiling, not wondering, can they do that in church? Of love being truly what makes a family for each and every single one of our families. So let's keep doing that. Let's keep celebrating. And um, as the offering baskets come around, we always have enough time to take the offering. LAUGHTER